So welcome to our monthly colloquia series, Physics for Development, so which is organized by the Forum on International Physics, the FIP, at the American Physical Society. So this week is a special opportunity for us to celebrate light. So indeed, so Monday 16 of May was the International Day of Light as a legacy action from the year of light 2015, which has been organized by our FIP uh, chair, so who is Johnny Mela that you see here, so on our panel, and uh, together with uh, John Dudley and uh, the UNESCO. So today, so we celebrate light sources, so like the sesame and especially cosmic news. So our life uh, science and physics matter colloquia uh, aim at enlightening so our FIP audience with exciting topics. So together we want to create a flow of ideas which is both educational and interesting for your community. So see for instance, last April forum. So we, we had exchange experience on human heritage using light source and neutron sources, but also other techniques like the second harmonic generation microscopy. So it's like uh, to reach out as well, more human perspective. So questioning the development on society. So we believe that transdisciplinary is the key for a better humanity. But today, so as promised, we are back to our FIP mascot, which is Polo Quest. So from our uh, first uh, year, so we had the anniversary last November, and Paula Catapano, Kevin Monero, and uh, Michael Strack invited us to this uh, breathtaking scientific expedition to save the Arctic white. The Polar Quest. So the Polar Quest has supported, uh, has been supporting as well the launching of this physics matter series with our dear inventor, the creator, so Luisa Cifarelli, who is here, so today speaking. So Luisa, um, so started one year and a half ago this uh, series, and uh, we want to hear more now about uh, this cosmic ray expedition, as we could see. So it will be today a two vox, vox colloquium. So to introduce another Polo Quest scientific explorer that you saw on the picture, so earlier, so with uh, Paula. And uh, so this is Professor Ambreta Pinaza, who is a researcher at the IFN in Bologna, and she's working at CERN as an expert in detector control system. She's also an expert maintainer, an amateur seller, more than an amateur, I would say, and she participated uh, in the Polo Quest expedition. And also, so as mentioned, so we have uh, um, the chance to have with us, uh, so Luisa Cifarelli, who is professor of experimental physics at the University of Bologna. So she has carried out research in subnuclear physics and astroparticle physics at uh, the major university in different laboratories in uh, Europe. So she is the member of the Academy Europa and the Academy of Science of Bologna. She is an honorary president of the Italian Physical Society, and she has been president of the European Physical Society, and is also on the Eurofermi Historical Museum of Physics and Research and Study Center in Italy, in the Centro Fermi. And today we have as well, so few members of our panel, our FIP panel, so with uh, uh, Johnny Mella from the ICTP in Trieste and Alan Hurd, so both uh, the share and the past share. And my name is Christine Dorf, so working at the European Spallation Source, and I'm the share elected of the FIP. So with this short introduction, then I leave uh, the floor to Luisa and Ombretta to uh, speak about this cosmic expedition. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. So let me share. Let me share. Okay. Okay. So first of all, thank you so much for this uh, invitation, uh, because it's always a pleasure to join uh, the, the, the friends of the American Physical Society and um, and it is always a pleasure to talk about this uh, adventure uh, in the beyond the Arctic Circle, which we uh, baptize uh, Polar Quest. Um, a few days ago, we we had um, I think that uh, 
we may heard a few words uh, by Joe uh, Ninella, maybe later on at the end or before the start of my talk. We had the International Day of Light, if I remember well, which is on the 16th of May. And of course, cosmic rays are very much related to an incredible source of light, which is the sun. So maybe um, you, you, Joe, would love to comment something at the end about, about the sun, how the sun will influence uh, um, our research. Would you like to do it right now? Well, maybe I should, uh, hi. Uh, maybe I should say something right now because being this, this is the International Day of Light was actually Monday, um, but this whole week we're doing something at ICDP in celebration, uh, which is a college on optics for students from uh, about 30 different countries around the world. And that starts, <laughs> unfortunately, at five. And so I, I, I'm going to have to really jump. Um, so at any rate, the, um, um, yeah, the day... Do you want me to say something about the day of light? Uh, I'm not sure what, what I understood. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now the, the day of light is, is, is a simple concept. It, it's following up from the year of light, which was really to celebrate all the uh, you know, light in, in every aspect, including philosophy and art, but also the technologies that, that can uh, actually help improve our, our, uh, our lives around the world. Um, and the, the day of light is just to keep that momentum going and to have a day each year where we celebrate all those uh, all the things about light, which which can actually help us improve uh, our, our lives, um, and it uh, it's a chance for schools around the world to get together to do projects to learn about uh, photonics, about uh, optics, but also also to just to think about it in, in philosophical terms about uh, uh, sh uh, shedding light on things. Uh, so whatever people would like to do, they can do under that banner of light, and that's it's a it's a it's a way for us all to talk to each other, to, to again to communicate science, talk to our uh, talk to our children, talk to our grandparents, talk to our policymakers, but uh, but have projects uh, really from the grassroots up all around the world for people just take a day and and really do something uh, where they they immerse themselves in in that particular topic. So anyway, that's that's what we've been doing for the last five years since the fifth anniversary. And we usually pick a theme. Uh, last year was trust in science. Uh, the year before it was education and, and science communication. Uh, this year we're really uh, coexisting with another international day, which is the internet, the UN International Day of Living Together in Peace. I can't think of a better thing to to be thinking about right at the moment uh, because you know, science also, no matter whether it's light or anything else also helps us uh, come to understanding one another uh, because we uh, the same the reason why CERN exists to unite Europe or Sesame exists to unite the Middle East it's really people uh, from different cultures and religions uh, and nationalities all working together on a common project not sharing knowledge but creating knowledge creating it together and that brings understanding when you bring understanding of people you bring peace so at any rate to th this year we're celebrating uh, also the International Day of Living Together in Peace, and that's sort of our topic, how science can help uh, achieve a better understanding of people around the world. Okay, anyway, that's, the, <laughs> that's, uh, that's it. Fantastic, yes, thank you. So, um, so I'm going to uh, say a few words uh, about the uh, how this uh, this expedition, which started a few years ago, is ongoing, and how uh, it is developing with uh, further interesting uh, things to to study and to explore. Um, for for those who are uh, maybe not totally familiar with, with it, um, I will recall our cosmic the cosmic rays we're talking about are essentially charged particles which come from from uh, deep space, and these uh, charged particles um, 
are primary cosmic rays, and these primary cosmic rays are essentially uh, protons and light nuclei. And uh, every second, uh, uh, each square meter of the Earth, of the Earth's surface, is struck by several thousands of such particles, and they uh, interact with the atmosphere, thus producing uh, a number of showers composed of secondary particles. Uh, these cosmic rays have been discovered more than a century ago, and uh, they, the origin of cosmic rays is quite uh, um, understood as far as low energy cosmic rays are uh, concerned. Uh, but as far as very high energy cosmic rays are concerned, then their source is still a big mystery. And uh, the most uh, uh, eminent uh, theoreticians and experimentalists are trying to describe the possible reasons for this incredible acceleration that the cosmic rays undergo when they reach the Earth, they reach accelerations much higher than those that we can produce in colliders such as LHC. So um, apart from other interests um, related to cosmic rays and uh, normal life, for instance, uh, um, how they are uh, provoking uh, effects on uh, human beings. Uh, are they <laughs> responsible of um, phenomena like lighting? There are experiments studying this uh, at CERN in particular. Uh, do they influence cloud formations? They are still open questions, right? Quite interesting. So um, the, the uh, study of cosmic rays is still very interesting. Now, if I take a primary cosmic ray in a proton, say a proton interacting with the atmosphere, it is going to produce different kinds of showers. Some of them are the hadronic shower component of the big shower that this cosmic ray will produce, made essentially of neutrons and protons. Then you have electromagnetic showers, which are essentially um, due to a uh, a pions producing photons and then electrons in cascade. And then we have um, charged pions, which are very uh, short lived, uh, decaying into muons. And these muons, thanks to uh, the Lorentz boost, can reach the ground. And uh, in um, in reality, we have uh, the majority of charged particles on ground, which are muons. At sea level, we have about one muon per centimeter square per minute. And uh, this is what we are going to talk about, the study of uh, cosmic muons on ground. Of course, they will keep information about the primary cosmic ray. Now, the <clears throat> Polar Quest project uh, you may have noticed three E's in, in the uh, title of my talk, is a byproduct, a wonderful byproduct of another project called the EEE Project Extreme Energy Event Pro Project. And this uh, project has the peculiarity to have created uh, um, an observatory of cosmic rays uh, on the Italian territory by uh, building uh, a large number of telescopes, which have been uh, built uh, with the most sophisticated techniques developed for experiments at CERN, namely using the multi-gap resistive plate chambers. But they have been built by high school students and they have been permanently installed in a network of high schools in Italy. This thanks to the, um, well, the proposal started in 2004, thanks to um, Zikiki, a professor in Bologna and former president of the European Physical Society, and not only. And then um, it was uh, it developed as a collaboration about, among various Italian institutions, but is, um, above all with the collaboration of CERN in Geneva. So the, here's the network to, of uh, the, the 
the telescopes installed in Italy. The red dots are the telescopes. The blue dots are schools connected via a network with the schools having uh, the telescope. So, uh, I mean, there are schools which can access other schools' telescopes. The orange dots are some research institutions where the, uh, let's say, the, the reference uh, detectors are installed. And as a whole, this is uh, more than 60 telescopes covering uh, more or less 10 degrees in latitude and 10 degrees in longitude. And the overall perimeter of this uh, uh, network of telescopes includes an area of half a million squared kilometers. Now here you see some students uh, at work at CERN building uh, the chambers. I have no time to discuss these chambers. They are essentially uh, a sandwich of uh, uh, plates uh, with a high voltage and inside there's a gas flowing, but the plates are made of glass. The, in between the spaces, uh, since the gap is very thin, are made, uh, are obtained through by stretching a fishing line. And uh, if a particle crosses uh, this uh, uh, capacitor, essentially, then a signal is induced on the electrodes, which are some copper strips. And uh, so the detectors are rather large. They are nicely equipped with readout strips. And uh, if you <clears throat> put some of these detectors, one on top of the other, then you end up with your telescope, which looks like uh, um, a children's bed with a few uh, levels. And <clears throat> you see some of the equipment built by students at CERN. Here are some of the equipment installed in high schools. And with this very nice physics has uh, is being done. The goal of the project is to detect showers, but also distance showers in coincidence, if possible. These are so far extremely rare and uh, maybe exotic events. And it would be extremely interesting to study such showers. Now, this is a simulation of a shower impacting on the city of Bologna in Italy, the city where I live. And you see the scale is a few kilometers, uh, uh, X and Y. And this is a very <clears throat> rare shower of about 10 to the 17 electron volt energy uh, produced by a primary proton interacting at 15 kilometer altitude in the atmosphere. And it produces 1 million muons uh, in the city of Bologna. Of course, uh, the core of the shower will give you the direction of the primary uh, proton. And what is interesting is that if you <clears throat> go higher in energy, you will get uh, more muons and larger showers. So if you look at the shower front and if you put uh, closed telescopes, then by detecting two parallel uh, um, tracks of such muons from the same shower, then in coincidence, then you will say, OK, fine, I am detecting not a single random muon, but a shower. And here you see a collection of uh, coincidence peaks among nearby telescopes. So these two, the first plot here refers to two nearby telescopes at CERN, but then we move from CERN to uh, schools uh, having two telescopes in the same uh, area or in different schools. Like uh, here, you see by increasing the distance, then the peak decreases and the background increases. And it is uh, rather difficult to detect coincidences for extended showers having um, tracks uh, even at more than one kilometer distance, but still belonging to the same shower. So the experiment has this uh, power. And moreover, since you have telescopes uh, all over Italy, in principle, as I said, you could detect correlated time correlated showers very distant from each other, even at 1000 kilometer distance from north to south. Okay, so, <clears throat> Each uh, detector is equipped with a GPS. The data 
are transferred directly to the main computer center in, uh, in Bologna. And um, the experiment uh, since uh, coordinated runs, uh, which started massively since 2015, with over 50 telescopes altogether taking data, has produced a number of results with over 110 billion cosmic rays already collected and reconstructed and available for interesting physics studies. But if you want to study the effects of um, the latitude on the cosmic ray flux, and as we will see, the effect of latitude is indeed interesting. And if you, in principle, would like to uh, study very, very long distance correlation between uh, distant showers, then uh, you would uh, accept the idea to have the EEE project sailing to the North Pole. I say sailing, which is the real meaning of the word, as you will see. So uh, why the effect of latitude is interesting, because uh, here's the Earth. Of course, this is uh, not, not um, in real scale, but it's just uh, an artist's view of the Earth with the uh, its um, magnetic field lines and the sun nearby. And of course, the geomagnetic field lines and the uh, lines of other magnetic fields in deep space are uh, affecting the flux of the cosmic rays. At the beginning, it was a very important question because um, um, one did not even know whether the cosmic particles were charged or neutral. So um, if they are charged, as they are, uh, then the effect of the uh, magnetic field should be uh, visible by sweeping away particles of low energy, depending on their um, impact at different latitudes. Okay. Now, apart from this uh, very interesting aspect of uh, the study, and it is interesting because cosmic rays are studied everywhere, underground, uh, in space, uh, with balloons, uh, I mean, with satellites, with balloons, uh, but um, at sea level and as a function of latitude, the data existing are not so many and moreover, they're not so precise and therefore precision measurements as we have obtained have come to be rather interesting. So the opportunity was given by um, an expedition organized uh, by uh, a science communicator of CERN, Paola Cap. Catapano, who is a kind of force of nature, who uh, took the occasion to celebrate a famous expedition which happened in 1928. And uh, the expedition we organized was in 2018, so 90 years later. So she took this celebration, and we'll see what I'm talking about, to organize a scientific expedition on the trail of the airship Italia. What was the airship Italia? The airship Italia was a mission, a scientific mission organized by um, this, uh, this gentleman called Umberto Nobile, who was a, um, um, an aviation uh, um, general, he was also an engineer and an explorer, and he, he had the know-how as an engineer to build in Italy uh, these kinds of um, huge airships, 100 meter longs, um, filled with hydrogen, and this one was called the Italia, and uh, it, it was not the first one, it was the second of a series, the first one being the Norge, identical, also built in Italy, and uh, the Norge was very successful in 1926 to reach the North Pole for the first time in history with an airship uh, traveling from King's Bay, now called the Nialesund, from the um, Svalbard Archipelago, which is the closest ground to, to the North Pole, where you only have water, no earth. 
And um, the expedition included uh, the famous explorer Roald Amundsen, uh, Nobile himself, and um, an explorer, polar explorer from the United States, who was also the supporter of the expedition called Ellsworth. So this is uh, uh, the Italia, um, which was uh, uh, a replica of the Noga, and it was supposed to make uh, a number of measurements of uh, the atmosphere of the um, Earth's magnetic uh, field of cosmic rays. On board, um, there was a, a, a physicist from uh, Czechoslovakia called Behunek, who was a pupil of Madame Curie, another Italian physicist uh, called Pontremoli, who was a colleague of Enrico Fermi, um, um, a meteorologist from, uh, from Sweden called Malgrim, and they had really a very interesting scientific program. Here you see um, the, the uh, airship at the uh, Svalbard Island, and here he, uh, the airship is taking off uh, for the, um, the, the mission it had to accomplish. Now it happened that on its way to the North Pole, uh, the, everything went well, but on the way back, there was a tremendous storm and uh, for um, unexpected reasons, uh, the, the airship crashed. This is a picture of uh, a very famous Italian magazine um, showing uh, the disaster. The, 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 the airship crashed on the pack ice. The gondola uh, with the crew uh, was uh, more or less destroyed. Uh, half of the crew um, was uh, left on the pack. Uh, some of them injured, and the other half of the crew flew away with the remaining uh, airship and was never found again. Now, this is uh, the, uh, um, let's say, historical motivation, and what uh, the um, uh, project uh, um, figured out by Paola Catapano wanted to do is to use a special uh, uh, sailing ship, especially conceived to be low consuming and uh, self sustainable to uh, go even in in Arctic and difficult waters and on board she gathered. Uh, a crew of scientists, uh, science communicators, with uh, this nice link of uh, the history of uh, the um, the the airship uh, Italia and also some geographers were on board to uh, try and explore the waters where the crash had happened. So it was a complex expedition with uh, uh, scientific and technological uh, doors of uh, challenges and uh, uh, people needed to have a sense for adventure and Ombretta Pinazza indeed has a sense for uh, a Venture. The um, the goals on board of Nanook uh, to leaving uh, from uh, from Iceland and going uh, to the Svalbard all around were the measurement of cosmic rays at unprecedented northern latitudes, the investigation of the Arctic environment, um, in particular concerning. Uh, uh, macro microplastic pollution or concerning uh, the, the situation as far as the temperature growth is concerned due to the threaten of uh, um, threatening climate change we are undergoing. And then also exploration of air with drones and water with multi-beam special equipment based on a multi-beam sonar. Uh, in those unknown Arctic areas. And in addition, as said, the celebration of this incredible crash in 1928, I must add that after this crash, for the survivor, the, the whole world uh, was motivated to, uh, once they received the SOS from the people on the pack ice, the whole world um, sent um, people to try, people with all means, uh, boats, uh, planes, uh, uh, to try and rescue the survivors. And it was really uh, an incredible story, uh, the story of the Red Tent. Okay, so Polar Quest was a polar expedition melting adventure, science and history. So in 1928, 
uh, three detectors were built. One was installed on board of the sailboard called Nanook. And then, as reference, two identical detectors were installed in a high school near Oslo and another one in Italy in Turin. And the detector had to fulfill very challenging requirements that said, not only in terms of dimensions, it had to be very compact, it could not be um, a gas detector as the one I have shown to you in solid high schools, but it had to be made of scintillators and very robust. Moreover, it had to be very light to be on board of this uh, uh, sailing boat. And moreover, since the sailing boat had to be uh, low consumption, uh, the power consumption of the detector itself had to be extremely low, less than 15 watts. What? The detector was made of tiles of scintillators read by silicon PMs, this, uh, very compact and efficient sensors. There were two planes uh, of uh, scintillators, everything was in a box. Here you see students who went to CERN to assemble the, the detectors according to the tradition of the EEE project. Uh, this is Omrita Pinazza here together with Professor Zikiki. And uh, this is um, just a photograph of the electronics which was uh, attached to the detectors. And apart from, of course, power, memory, GPS, and so on, I want to stress that there was a gyroscope, an accelerometer, a magnetometer, a temperature, a barometric pressure, and humidity sensor uh, set uh, embedded in the detector. Okay, then the detector in a hatch was placed on top of the deck, replacing a hublot, and, uh, and there it went. And here you see the crew which went to, uh, um, to, to um, Iceland to, to uh, test and install the detector. And this is Ombretta, Ombretta Pinazza on board, attaching uh, the data acquisition cable. And here you see the students uh, in the schools, as said, in Oslo and in Torino, in Torino, who had to monitor the detector during the travel of PolarQuest. So PolarQuest traveled uh, on board of Nanook in 2018, and uh, the ice, uh, the pack ice, uh, the, 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 the ice cap at the North Pole did not touch the uh, completely the, the Svalbard Islands here, and therefore the circumnavigation could be achieved. This would have been impossible the year before or after. You see that the ice is uh, um, grabbing the, the uh, Svalbard due to the fluctuation. So it was a nice combination. Mm -hmm. But however, you see the ice was there. This is uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Nanook going uh, on, on its route to the Svalbard Islands. You see um, moments of the navigation. These are pictures pictures taken with a drone. Here in the background, you see one of the glaciers of uh, the, the islands and uh, these hills, are the, these are really cliffs with uh, uh, tens of meters of uh, height. And uh, there, there's ice uh, floating in the water nearby these glaciers. And this is visible from uh, such a pic picture taken from the mouth of the uh, boat and one, of course, navigating near the coast had to be careful about uh, these pieces of ice, um, which could have been also big enough to uh, damage the boat. Um, this is a picture taken at the very northern latitude, which was reached by Nanook, namely 82 degrees north, they, when they were trying to reach the place where the airship Italia had uh, had its accident. Uh, here you see a picture of the uh, onboard instruments recording this uh, extreme latitude. And of course, they could not go further because uh, this is the ice, uh, it's the frozen sea, which cannot be crossed with a sailing boat like Nanook. Life on board of Nanook, uh, people are uh, eating and uh, discussing, but they are also working, as you can see here. Uh, one had to also take shifts uh, outside, and um, as uh, uh, probably Ombretta will uh, 
witness sometimes it could uh, be extremely cold especially when coming back uh, on the coast which was not um the the touched by the um, uh, by the gulf stream so when going up on the west uh, the gulf stream was uh, somehow helping while on the other side it was damn cold now the trip um, lasted 45 days 3500 miles i would say okay um now the duty cycle was uh, of a almost 1,000 hours, Polar One on board, this is the name of the detector, took data with 90% efficiency, um, taking into account uh, sometimes weather conditions or some difficult situation. The other two detectors installed, uh, the reference ones installed on ground had 100% efficiency, they took data during the whole period and has a role. 100 million million uh, tracks were collected. Data were corrected for many things, for temperature, for pressure. There is a, an anti-correlation between the pressure and the cosmic ray um, muon flux due to absorption from the atmosphere. Um, and then, of course, so you have to take into account the role of the boat the the cosmic rays muons have um, an angular distribution a zenith angle distribution which goes like cos square cos square theta and uh, therefore you have to correct for inclination and uh, the data were corrected after calibration and uh, uh, I must say that uh, uh, a real uh, uh, incredible accident which happened during navigation could help uh, to check the, val the validity of our corrections. But this is not a joke because there was a real accident. The, the boat got stranded on some rocks of the, the coast. And uh, luckily enough, it was at the beginning very, very serious. But then thanks to the tide, the boat could restart and the damage was not serious and could be fixed immediately afterwards. But you can see that uh, the inclination was really impressive. It happened because of the fog, because the coast is not well known. And so uh, when the sun came back, they even with the tender, they tried to see whether they could do something, but they could do nothing but wait for the tide. And uh, this is an impressive picture which shows how tiny and uh, some maybe harmless so we are in front of uh, the huge and overwhelming nature but uh, everything uh, went on well and finally uh, nanook could continue its trip and the result of this trip was a measurement um over weeks of data taking around the small bird of uh, mm, uh, high precision muon flux uh, for latitudes going from 66 to 82 degrees north. The data have already been published with less than 1% uh, uh, error. Um, the, um, the cosmic ray flux is absolutely stable and flat above these 66 degrees latitude, which corresponds to, uh, let's say, the Trump's latitude and above. And uh, this is an unprecedented precision, precision for such a uh, measurement. And you still see some uh, modulation, which is uh, nicely due to external factors related to the sun. This is the, the crew having reached, um, uh, having circumnavigated the Svalbard on their return. Now, as you can see, so everybody is happy. You can see Paola Catapano here, the skipper, and this is Ombretta uh, showing uh, a, victor, a victory sign. Um, now, um, two documentaries have been produced about this uh, expedition and in case you're interested i can provide the coordinates to uh, view them um, after this trip and you can see here the route of nanook so leaving from iceland circumnavigating the swalbert and coming back to to norway after this trip um 
you you can realize that uh, it was interesting to see what was the situation below 66 degrees north and to do that uh, the same detector that had been on board of Nanook was transported uh, in 2019 on the road, on the road from uh, north of Germany all the way down to the southernmost island in Italy, the island of Lampedusa, which is uh, closer to the uh, African coast than to the Sicilian coast. And with the same detector, uh, touring from school to school, as you can see in these pictures, uh, further measurements were made with the same detector to span the latitude range. Now, as uh, it is obvious from what I said, that if the lines of the dipole field of the Earth are um, as shown here, and if you imagine that uh, all uh, um, cosmic rays in part uh, more or less uh, perpendicular to the uh, um, surface of the uh, earth then you will uh, clearly see that at the north poles the tracks will be parallel to the magnetic field lines perpendicular to the uh, magnetic field lines uh, the closer you uh, get to the equator and therefore what you expect is uh, if you measure the intensity of cosmic rays as a function of latitude when going from zero degrees up to 90 degrees these are the poles uh, north and south pole and zero is the equator then you expect a modulation and a flattening as nanook has measured above 66 degrees fine and so uh, if you put together the data measured by nanook and those that were measured on the road you clearly see an effect this is the first time that with the same detector such a huge interval in in latitude has been measured it is almost 50 degrees from this point in lampedusa up to this very extreme point um, at 82 degrees latitude north and you can see that there is a variation of, uh, of the flux um, an observable variation which is not very big it's less than 10 percent but thanks to the precision of these measurements it is very clearly evident here of course all the data have been corrected by pressure efficiency orientation of the detector the materials on top of the detector because sometimes uh, some measurements were made inside the, the car transporting uh, the detector or um, close to a building. Also, an interesting effect was corrected for because it was discovered here is the date and here is the rate in as measured in the uh, detectors, uh, the polar detectors, and those which remained on ground, namely in Torino and in Oslo, after the trip of Nanook, which is indicated here, which ended uh, um, end of August in 2018, well, they continued recording data and they recorded a modulation a seasonal modulation related to the sun activity. This is again something a new measurement, a modulation on, of plus or minus uh, uh, 2%, say, which is related, uh, since it is related to the sun, to the temperature along the year. And probably it's interesting because if it is related to the temperature and to the expansion of the atmosphere, uh, the rate of cosmic rays could be uh, an interesting monitor of what happens in our atmosphere due to the climate change situation. Okay, so this is a fit to the overall data and you see that here the situation is as expected flat and then the flux decreases and there is a knee which is around 50 degrees latitude. Um, the uh, previous overall measurements were performed in the 30s uh, not with high precision, but they were performed by people like Compton, Millikan, putting together for the first time many, many experiments with ionization chambers. And uh, on the road and on Nanook, our data cover this uh, region that you can see here, pink and blue, and blue. And therefore, as you can see, the behavior uh, that we obtain uh, seems to follow this uh, this curve, which is not really fitting the data, which are 
very much scattered, but nevertheless, uh, this fit was made by uh, two um, important theoreticians, Le Maitre and Valarta, who at MIT in 1932 with one of the special computers um, existing there at the time, could make precise trajectory calculations just having in mind protons and electrons. And a nice uh, behavior was obtained with a, uh, um, a knee at around 50 degrees latitude. Okay, now in green, you see one of the today's um, more sophisticated uh, um, Monte Carlo simulations. And uh, however, um, the, the tuning of the Monte Carlo has to be adjusted. Um, the, the slope of the Monte Carlo reproduces the data of the Monte Carlo, but the Monte Carlo seems to have a little problem here because the knee is too low. But so the data we are producing are also a good indication to tune the Monte Carlo. This is another way to show the same thing as a function of the so-called geomagnetic cutoff, so the rigidity, and it follows the data now, our Nanook data are squeezed here, and the equator is instead on the right of this plot, and the expected dormant function nicely fits the data. Okay, so this is uh, the measurement achieved. It's being published currently. And after that, uh, we have decided to install permanently three such detectors at the Swalbert Islands and um, perform some uh, systematic and uh, long lasting uh, stable measurements of the flux of cosmic rays at the North Pole. And this is how I will now give the floor to Ombretta. Thank you for your attention. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, I don't know if you, Christine, maybe you want to. Indeed, uh, we have a question. So maybe, so that could be the opportunity. Hmm? So indeed, I, I just mentioned that uh, if you can ask your question during the presentation, that could be as well nice with raising your hand. Otherwise, you put it as uh, it's done. So in the the Q and A. So we have uh, so um, Antonio uh, Samura Montejo who has asked, who is asking. So where the crew totally self sufficient? So during uh, the whole trip, and did you had enough supplies of the sailing boat for those forty five days? So maybe actually this is a question from Breta. <laughs> yes, yes, from Breta. I was not sailing. So there was organizing, <laughs> organizing and analyzing, but not saying. The, um, the travel was actually divided, let's say, in three parts. So uh, the first part was from Iceland through Greenland and to the, the Svalbard archipelago. And this was in, uh, in deep sea. So we had to be full sufficient for 20 days there. Then uh, we had the possibility to buy again food and to recharge the boat and refresh the water on board. So we had this, um, this second part during three weeks and then one last part to go back to Norway. So 45 days it would have been, it would have been challenging, but this board, this boat is especially built to be quite self-sufficient. So it would have been possible, but we had the possibility to, to re refresh and re reorganize the boat uh, two times during the travel. <laughs> Very good. So I think it's really good. Okay. Now, indeed, we can proceed with this. Uh... Yes. So thank you, Luisa. I take exactly the relay from your slide, and I will talk uh, main, mainly through images uh, uh, about what happened during after the 2019 when the uh, so after these two phases of the sailing and the travel by car through Europe. So after four years. Um, now, uh, the, this uh, four years ago, sorry, uh, we we started with this big adventure with the sailing through through the northern sea and up to the North Pole, and then we had the second phase, as you have seen, uh, along across Europe uh, by car to cover uh, another range of latitudes from the south of Italy to the north of Germany, and but during the navigation in two thousand eighteen. Uh, uh, 
I, I had the chance to be on board and to participate to this wonderful expedition. But uh, Luisa, Professor Luisa Cifarelli came to visit us while we had a stop in, at the scientific base in Nioles on the, on the Svalbard archipelago. And she had the brilliant idea to uh, place the detectors in the next future in that place and do continuous measurement from there. So we had the opportunity to explore a bit the territory and we identified together three places which were a bit uh, more uh, distant each other from what we wanted, but they were nice places to install the detectors because they we there we had power and network and they were uh, supervised by scientific personnel uh, that could uh, could uh, help us in case of need. So we identified these three places, which can be seen in this uh, photo more or less. One is in the is one of the buildings of the scientific base and the other two are far away uh, laboratories which are anyway quite well equipped. So in May 2019 I had the opportunity to go back to Neolism once more but this time by plane. You can see here a beautiful view from the plane. Uh, in May the nature on, uh, in Arctic is really different from what I could see in August in full summer, because there is still a lot of snow, the snow coverage is almost uh, uniform everywhere, and uh, there is light uh, as well, 24 hours a day. So it was a really special uh, approach, even if not by, uh, if it was not done on a boat. So we traveled uh, uh, on this uh, nice uh, plane, uh, which is uh, serving especially the scientific uh, personnel of this base. It's not a tourist uh, or regular flight, let's say. And this is one beautiful view of the internal territory of the Svalbard uh, archipelago. The sea is still uh, quite uh, occupied with uh, ice, especially the coast uh, in the uh, on the eastern side, but uh, uh, on the western side we, where uh, Neolesund is, uh, is built, it, it's, uh, it's not so bad. Uh, this is uh, thanks to the Gulf Stream, as you have heard uh, Lisa mentioning it. So this is uh, a photo, for example, taken at midnight uh, with the light, which is a bit low, but anyway, is still very, very bright and and uh, very fascinating. This is again taken at midnight uh, in, in the scientific base. All the buildings that you see are laboratories or uh, hostels for the scientific personnel, which is normally uh, present there in a number between uh, 50 and 100, let's say. It's a very small uh, scientific base. Uh, at the center of the village, there is a statue in the honor of Amundsen, uh, the, explorator that first reached the North Pole on the Norge uh, Zeppelin uh, air, airship that you have seen in Luisa presentation. And in the base, there are um, several infrastructures devoted to scientific uh, research, like uh, these telescopes, uh, antennas, and others. And uh, there is still uh, the, the mast where the airship uh, was uh, docked. When, when it had uh, this, uh, at the departure. So the, this, um, this mast on the, on the right side of the photo, it has uh, more than 90 years and it's there since uh, the period of Nobile and his uh, unlucky expedition to the North Pole. This is a, this is a, a view, a webcam, which is, uh, available every uh, continuously and it's a magnificent view of this bay and the, the base. As you can see the sea here is always uh, pretty open uh, even if this was taken in April just before uh, uh, last year in April um, there were still some uh, some uh, ice uh, small icebergs floating near near the coast near the, the base. Okay, the weather was not always so kind, uh, so we had snow, we had storms, uh, uh, but uh, the environment there is so beautiful. We had um, animals uh, around, uh, these are reindeers uh, coming and grazing around uh, the, the buildings in the bays. Uh, these are goose. Anyway, the, the, one of the most astonishing things for me 
in this area is the presence of birds. Uh, in summer, it's very noisy. The, you can feel the presence of many animals around, and it's really an interesting thing for uh, for biologists and scientists, scientists uh, in life science. Um, so just before our arrival, the three detectors had been uh, shipped and were uh, already present in the base. This is uh, when we opened the boxes and prepared the detectors for the installation. Uh, so we, we were a team uh, of uh, technician engineers and uh, physicists, and we prepared one by one the three detectors for the installation. One of them was uh, left uh, in the Italian base, uh, which was very easy, let's say, and always uh, uh, inhabited and supervised by someone. So one detector was left there. And then the two remote sites were more than one kilometers away. And these were a bit more difficult to reach because uh, when you move around in this area, you have to be uh, to have someone with a gun and to be prepared to to protect yourself or to uh, to avoid uh, the, the, the polar bears, which can be very dangerous and can uh, also approach the, the, the area where people is living. So we had to go uh, with uh, personnel with a specific preparation. The second site that we chose was uh, near this beautiful uh, uh, tower, this infrastructure, which is there to measure uh, continuously several environmental parameters and is used by our Italian colleagues from the uh, Research Council to perform their research on the atmospheric boundary layer. So we are also cooperating with them to, to share the data, the environmental data and study correlations with our cosmic rays. So we, we on the bottom of this tower, you can see a small cabin, and this is where we installed the, the second detector. And this is the team with the, the personnel with the gun that, uh, uh, that uh, took care of the installation. To go there, we were using these uh, snow mobiles, and even the detector was uh, dragged with, through this uh, sledge uh, with a motorbike. As, uh, as you have seen already, the, the weather was not always uh, perfect, so we had difficult conditions. However, it, May is a beautiful uh, period to go to that uh, northern uh, latitudes. Uh, so even uh, a few days of bad weather uh, are very fascinating and you can, you can I guess, uh, appreciate from this photo the beauty of this uh, landscape. So, um, uh, we were a team uh, of, uh, of Italian uh, scientists mainly, and we were hosted in the Italian Arctic Station, which is called the Dirigibile Italia in memory of the, of the expedition of Nobile. Uh, the, here, the atmosphere is very friendly. There is, a, there is always someone uh, uh, working on site and taking care of the infrastructure and uh, hosting the, the visitors like we were uh, in that period. Since 2019, the three detectors are taking data almost continuously. However, in 2020, one of them stopped working. We were in full COVID uh, emergency, so we couldn't, nobody could uh, intervene. And the, the, the few scientists on site uh, were not specialists and could not help us. So, at, from that moment, we were waiting for a time window and to have the possibility to go back and fix uh, the problems on this detector. The second detector was on the same time in Italy. And uh, the other two that we number here, like three and four, took data on their uh, sites uh, with, with uh, a very good um, uh, continuity. Uh, from um, from our uh, houses, from our laboratories, so we were monitoring continuously the data taking. We had some hiccups from time to time, but we could recover almost all online, at, except uh, that detector. For that, finally, we found uh, uh, a slot uh, in September 21 to return to the Nihalizund and uh, perform uh, the, our intervention. As you can see from this photo, 
the, the environment in end of September, uh, beginning of October is very different from the summer. Um, there is almost no snow and uh, the weather is not so nice. Um, furthermore, the travel was pretty complicated because uh, during COVID we had very few flights available. Well, the pro sanitary protocols were uh, strong both uh, for traveling and uh, in uh, Norway and to, the, to access uh, the scientific base uh, in Svalbard. So while in 2018 uh, we were this happy team, uh, in 2019, another happy team uh, celebrating the installation. In 2021, in September, we, uh, we could only be there, two of us, uh, well masked and following all the obligations of the sanitary crisis that were still, uh, uh, still present. However, this is the full population of the scientific base uh, uh, during that period. Uh, we were uh, less than 30. And there was this day called the Scientists for Future. So we took this photo all together in front of the uh, Amundsen statue and uh, with a nice uh, weather balloon uh, on the back. <laughs> so to go back to, to, the, to the mission in 2021, um, the environment was anyway very fascinating. The low light was uh, very low and the temperature was uh, still acceptable. There were very few animals around, uh, some reindeers as usual. Uh, these are very easy to see, to spot. Um, no birds at all, apart from stationary ones like these uh, grouse. <laughs> A few foxes, uh, Arctic foxes, uh, looking around the buildings to find some food and seals in the sea. Uh, apart from these visitors, uh, the, the scientific base saw very few uh, tourists and very few scientists coming because of all the problems uh, that were uh, still uh, present in that period. So we had uh, one of the detectors installed at the base. We, we performed uh, some uh, repairing and upgrading and profiting of the fact that she, this is very easy reachable. So we both could uh, do our interventions. Then uh, we had the, the detector at the climate change tower, which was not working. And there we could also perform our, our intervention in a, a bit less uh, comfortable uh, situation, but still we could recover uh, the detector quite easily. And then we have uh, the third detector, which is uh, installed in a nice laboratory um, called uh, Groove Badet. These are photos of the intervention. And ju just a word about this laboratory, because this is a, a nice one used for aerosol uh, studies. It was in the past of the, used as a bus for the miners uh, living in the area. And just to mention that this was built uh, several times of years ago, and it was built on solid, uh, solid rocks, but on a, on a permafrost uh, ground. So now that the permafrost uh, is uh, melting and freezing every year and changing it and uh, moving continuously, this laboratory is ri risking to collapse. Uh, even if the, the supports are still solid, the, the building is uh, moving every year. So we risk to have to move the, the detectors again and find another place uh, because this environment is really fragile and uh, uh, not static at all. So just to go back quickly to physics, uh, the three detectors that we have at the North Pole are taking the down the same time. And uh, we are collecting statistics to study the coincidences. So in the first uh, part, in the upper part of this slide, you can see some statistics about the coincidences taken, uh, seen by two of the three detectors. And on the bottom one, other the other two uh, coincidences be be between number four and three. So these uh, studies are continuing. We are collecting a lot of data. The coincidences are quite rare because these detectors are small and are far, are far away from each other. Uh, but this is a very important study that we are uh, still uh, uh, performing and uh, that soon, uh, I hope, uh, will, will become uh, an interesting publication. 
uh, then we are, as we are there since already three years, we are um, monitoring the uh, seasonal rate. Uh, now we are in, in a phase where a new solar cycle has started and, and will find its maximum in 2025. So it's very important for us to study, to, to perform long-term studies uh, and see the solar uh, activity through our uh, detector uh, uh, like this. So, so this is the statistics, the, the, the data collected during three years. Another, uh, another byproduct of, uh, of our detectors is the reaction to these uh, uh, coronal mass ejections. In, in, for example, in um, November to 2021, there was a very strong one because there were two ejections uh, close each other and one reached the second, so the effect was really magnified. And this was one of the biggest uh, in, the, in the last seven, 10 years. It, it was visible uh, in all the detector sites uh, around the world. Especially in this uh, fin Finnish uh, detect neutron monitor that is reported here in this slide. So we went to our data and we verified that also our small detectors, uh, the Norpol, could see this uh, decrease in the muon rate uh, exactly with the same shape at the same time of the of the other monitors. So um, we we were happy to. <laughs> to be able to, to verify this, uh, this Forbosch decrease we, even with our detectors. And we are analyzing now other similar events to verify if they are in, um, in correspondence with uh, similar events uh, uh, like other uh, coronal mass ejections. And uh, to conclude, uh, I have an extra uh, effect that we could see with the with our detectors as you have seen from Luisa's slides the detectors are equipped with uh, with many sensors among which we have uh, three pressure sensors that are able to measure the atmospheric pressure variations with uh, quite a good precision even if they are uh, simple and commercial sensors so and in january there was this huge explosion of a volcano in uh, in the tonga area in the pacific and this was really an exceptional event uh, like uh, the krakatoa in indonesia one century more than one century ago so all the, the specialists of the world were uh, excited to be able to measure the shock waves propagating in the atmosphere and because these were pretty, uh, they, they were alive for a long time, these waves uh, propagated from the center of this explosion in as a circles, of course, at a certain altitude in the atmosphere, but they were uh, going through the whole world uh, and doing several turns, several revolutions. So we could uh, also detect the same waves uh, on the other, almost on the other side of the world, with uh, twelve uh, hours uh, delay, uh, we, we reached uh, the, the waves reached the North Pole, and we could see the the primary, the secondary waves, and a few more oscillation. This is the plot of the of the variation that we could measure in our uh, pressure sensors. Uh, these are effect of the, uh, of this uh, for sure uh, they have been correlated to this uh, explosion and we are quite happy to have to be able to detect uh, the, these things because even if it's not a primary research for us it was a very interesting thing especially for our students that are always active in the analysis of the data that we that we make able that we make uh, available uh, in, in the in the data center in Italy. So uh, this is my conclusion. Uh, we had uh, three interesting phases of this Polar Quest project. Uh, um, we from time to time it did maintenance uh, and but otherwise uh, the data taking is nicely ongoing since four years. We are still collecting data, and we sometimes we are even able to see extra things like this uh, coronal mass ejections or uh, pressure waves in the atmosphere. So that's it. Uh, I guess uh, there are some questions, may, maybe for Luisa or for me, and I will be happy to to answer with her to the questions. Thank you.
And thank you, Christine, for inviting us uh, to this nice uh, event. Thanks a lot uh, to enlighten us uh, with those uh, information. Uh, so do we have a question so in the audience? Uh, we could have as well the possibility to give you the microphone, so if you wish. Uh, or in the panelist as well. So we have a question so from Alan. So then you can speak live. Excellent. Um, thanks. Uh, that was really great, especially to hear both sides of the story this morning. Uh, I wondered if either of our speakers can comment on the origins of the uh, uh, energetic po protons that you're uh, finding. Can you really uh, integrate the equation of motion back through all of that crazy thing, stuff going on, especially in the magnetosphere? I will answer by no means. <laughs> 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 of course not. I mean, the um, the origin of the cosmic rays are multiple. Um, you, you have nearby uh, stars, uh, you have uh, uh, far away stars, but the point is that um, you have, I don't have it with me, but the exponential curve of the rate of primary cosmic rays as a function of energy uh, which is analyzed uh, by different kinds of uh, uh, detectors, of course. Uh, you have to go in space or underground and so on. Uh, they, they show a change of regime at a certain point. So this is why one talks about a knee and an ankle and so on. And uh, th th there is still... Um, a mystery about the highest values of the energies. Um, because even Enrico Fermi was involved in a very interesting theory about how acceleration of cosmic rays could be achieved through magnetized plasma deriving from incredible explosions uh, where the uh, uh, particles could, could undergo some, uh, some really um, uh, overwhelming accelerations. But nevertheless, although his theory was qualitatively correct, there are new data from satellites uh, that still uh, uh, leave a degree of uncertainty. And so it's really uh, a nice uh, thing to, to understand and to explore with different kinds of detectors. Of course, our detector is not so powerful because we we sample, I'm talking about the Italian network, we sample very rarely uh, a large um, territory, but uh, we, we don't have a, um, a dense network. There are experiments uh, like, like um, the um, uh, Auger Observatory in particular, but not only. Uh, because you may explore plenty of things uh, uh, related. Also, you could look at the gammas uh, uh, to, to look for these violent uh, events of the uh, of the uh, of space that might generate these uh, cosmic rays. So uh, it's still an open question, very interesting open question. But in our case, we do not sample this high energy component of the primary cosmic rays. We are a much, at much lower energies. Uh, the, the, the other thing that is still a very, very open question is why uh, we do see nuclei and not light nuclei and not anti-nuclei in space. Hmm? This is again, um, why there's no antimatter. Hmm? So it, it's a research which, uh, when, after the war, when we started building our colliders, seemed to be obsolete, but in reality it is not. And we do not mention here neutrino physics, which is also extremely interesting, plus all the search for, uh, you, you have heard about the origin of this unknown uh, matter that could be dark matter, or um, uh, the the um, supersymmetric particles. I mean, plenty of unknowns to be understood. 
So it's it's really uh, very challenging, and this is why you have you have researchers going uh, everywhere um, with uh, all sorts of detectors, and uh, as said, on ground, underground, and in space. So it's uh, very nice. Job security. Mm -hmm. Job security. Job security. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in reality, in reality, uh, when when the colliders are in crisis, then you have astroparticle physics uh, that becomes uh, more important, and then uh, you know you have these phases uh, of uh, of research alternating. So it's job security in a way, but I think it's the way research goes on, because at the beginning, uh, when when the muons, the pions, and so on were discovered in cosmic radiation or the strange particles, then to study them more, we needed uh, the accelerators. And for decades, we, we could really rely on accelerators to teach us plenty of things. And now it seems that uh, there is a moment where accelerators are telling us things, but maybe not as much as we want, and then we can still look at the sky. So it's important. Thanks a lot for your answer. So for the question, so we have uh, one question that uh, so Uli Gottlatz from uh, Strasbourg University, so from the CNRS could ask. So I will allow you to talk. So you can ask the question live, Uli. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, my question is in fact very much related to the last questions a bit because I mean, what you measure with these small detectors uh, is really not, I mean, you learn very little, I think, about cosmic rays. What you learn more is about uh, the interaction with the uh, Earth's magnetic field and the atmosphere. And uh, so I always wondered because, I mean, very often you do this type of small experiments with students. And uh, so I want to, when you put there these three detectors in coincidence, was there really, do they, from Monte Carlos, do you know how much do you, in principle, you should go a bit higher in energy of the primary cosmic rays, but I think the effect is very little. I mean, you, all this detector measure may, mainly muons, which are secondary particles of, um, secondary particles by the interactions of, uh, all cosmic rays integrated over the whole spectrum in the at atmosphere. So it's really, I always wonder by these coincidences, what do you gain more than just um, maybe a cleaner signal, but uh, you're basically dominated by muons and uh, you don't have a, I think you don't have a handle on the energy. And uh, when you just said, uh, and the answer to the previous question that these uh, networks you put up in Italy with the schools, I mean, there are many of those projects um, existing since uh, 20 years or so. But uh, do you get really uh, results on the origin of the cosmic rays, which are compatible or competitive with the results which were made by detectors like Cascade or Oh, bigger. Roger, uh, that I mentioned. So I, I can uh, tell you the following. First of all, the, the, um, the detectors that are now uh, installed in, in the North Pole of Uru or which were on a boat are, of course, not uh, students' detectors because, I mean, they're a little bit more sophisticated, but still, they are just two planes of scintillators. So uh, they are not tracking, and uh, therefore, the, what what the interest is uh, said to have some monitor of the secondary muons. And they are the northernmost detectors uh, uh, of muons we have on Earth, honestly speaking. And so, if we look at coincidences, we measure showers in the North Pole. These showers could, in principle, be um, connected uh, 
through GPS uh, time stamp with very distant showers, or for instance, with other kinds of detectors like uh, the neutron uh, network detector. So this is a, a, a working process where we are trying to imagine how we could correlate these signals with other information. Now, coming back to Italy, the, the pe peculiarity of these detectors is that, first of all, they are tracking detectors. Therefore, we may have an idea of the uh, direction of these uh, muons. Of course, these are secondary muons and so on, but still uh, there is a tracking uh, device. And the other thing is that uh, we are the, uh, so far, uh, once we detect a shower through a parallel uh, uh, coincidence, so a parallel track coincidence or by multiple tracks, I mean, I, I didn't describe uh, the analysis, then we may say we have a shower somewhere, say, in a cluster of detectors in Sicily, and we might look for a shower, an, analog an analogous uh, shower produced, say, for instance, in the north of Italy. And these long distance shower correlations are a peculiarity of our detector, which has not been achieved so far. And we have published already uh, first limits on shower coincidences uh, at more than a thousand kilometer distance. So this is the peculiarity. Now about the energy. No, we don't measure the energy. We are muon trackers. However, uh, with enough statistics and uh, using uh, some some likelihood uh, procedure, we might infer some some uh, um, energy related to the showers we measure. But we do not measure showers at very high energy, as uh, other experiments do. So could it be any capacity as well for that? Because then it would be good to cross correlate with, I mean, places like the Hayes indeed, or where they make as well some high energy measurement. So it would well, be uh, the, the, at a certain point, we had started a collaboration with uh, um, um, a group um, of, um, with a, an educational project in the, in the Netherlands, where they put some scintillators on top of the roofs of some uh, school buildings, so different kinds of uh, detectors. And um, so the idea would be to have correlated showers. But you, it is hard to, to do it because in principle, we all agree we should collaborate and so on, but then it, it is not so, so simple, but um, it, is, uh, it is an ongoing idea. I mean, the problem, the problem is always that you need lots of Monte Carlos to really understand the events. I mean, that is, well, for, I think it's uh, main to get back to the inner primary energy of a shower, even if you measure some showers with uh, a few thousand particles, and it's very difficult. It's not easy and straightforward uh, to estimate the energy, and you need lots of uh, lots of events and uh, to get a spectrum and so but my uh, question was really what is the the range of uh, energies you you are sensitive to is it on the tv scale or uh, mm, i uh, tv is uh, is too much i think we are below um you know we have collected more than 100 billion uh, muons so we are analyzing this data and the, the, the distribution is exponential. But uh, no, we are below, definitely below. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Julie. And indeed, for the, as you were mentioning, Lisa, for the educational purpose. So then we have a, a question <laughs> to raise by uh, Silvana Westbury, who is the, the manager as well of uh, the lightsource.org. So it's an honor as well to have her here interested in our topic. So I will read the question. So saying indeed, uh, and thanking you for this amazing educational project uh, for the school. So do you know if they, it has been inspiring as well all the science project with school in Italy and elsewhere in the world? Whenever we, we have made meetings, uh, international meetings related to this project, 
Um, you know, there is a very interesting outreach collaboration called IPOG, which is the uh, International Particle Physics Outreach Group, um, which has um, um, participants from all the major labs uh, the world over. So I think that there is a good network that uh, has been established through this IPOG. And uh, there are plenty of activities. Um, I would say that the peculiarity of this project, but it is not the only one. I, the other one, uh, I don't remember the name of this other project in the Netherlands, but let's say that in terms of dimensions, so network of telescopes or detectors uh, in such a way that you can, uh, with all limitations that we already heard a second ago, um, you, you can do some, some uh, real physics measurement, um, some um, precise um, rate measurements, monitoring this and that, and also some, some search for long distance shower color relations. There are, to my knowledge, in Europe, only two projects, our projects and another one, which are at the same time, educational and physics uh, projects. Other projects concerning education are more at the, how can I say, masterclass uh, level, hmm? where you really do some nice demonstration, you try and involve the kids in, uh, in measurements, in physics, uh, even in some uh, data analysis, but it's, it's a different story. Uh, let's say that uh, the, the uh, uh, dual role of experiment and educational uh, project is is rare, and uh, I only know very few uh, um, projects of this type. Indeed, and maybe I could add as well on that note for the educational department in Fermilab. So they also have uh, for the high school program, so for cosmic ray uh, analysis, and this was as well a command by uh, Jimmy Santucci, who was as well listening. So I think it will be good because he's also asking for connection because it could be complementary as well to see what the Nanook as well has uh, find out and then to connect in between so the, the different continent. So we will gather all of those information. I think it, it's a good idea to find back as well from the Netherlands, uh, this project and to, to put the, the people in contact. Mm -hmm. But I think that they, they, these kinds of projects, apart from outreach, those who can really make measurements, even the, the, the four bush decrease from uh, uh, a corona ejection or, or from the sun, well, it is not obvious that uh, this is a measurement that one makes with, uh, with uh, non-dedicated networks like, I don't know, the, the neutron monitor network, the, the, which is all over the place. So these things are things that can be nicely measured with um, this kind of experiments. And then at the same time, they are, uh, the, these experiments are educational tools. And um, I, I believe it's interesting. I think we all do. So it's really some kind of a nice project. We could build up some kick and some little um, um, main presentation in terms of how to, to, to build up this as well. And I'm sure CERN has as well certainly some, some kind of uh, existing material that we can distribute. Very mm -hmm. good. So I think that uh, we are coming to the end. So maybe from Alan, or did you, it was your old question. No, it's a new question. Please. It's a new question uh, that I actually put in chat to the to the panel. Umbretta, have, have what sort of effects has COVID had on your project? Are you delayed right now? Uh, can you say again? Sorry, I. Yeah, what sort of effects has the pandemic had <laughs> on on your on your ar Arctic science? So. Uh... On the Arctic uh, detectors activity, uh, apart from the fact of not going there for, uh, for the reparation, it was pretty smooth. However, for the school detectors, this was a big, uh, big issue because uh, as the schools were closed for a long period, 
and the detectors in the schools have to be monitored and supervised. They had to be shut down for security reasons. So all the schools were very, uh, very keen of recovering their detectors and restarting, but for several months they had to, to, to stop to stop that mm -hmm. taking, uh, to switch off detectors, switch off the gas, the, the power supplies and everything. So um, they were so happy now to, to be able to restart uh, and we are seeing them one by one reappearing in the monitoring system. Okay. For us, it was just a technique, just logistics problem that we could, right. uh, that right. we could uh, overcome. It was not so bad, but the schools have suffered a lot. <laughs> so if there is a next pandemic, then they will uh, be able to reach uh, also all those recording and get more time as well to analyze. <laughs> Although <laughs> hopefully it will never happen. <laughs> so thanks again so for your wonderful presentation. So you really bring us to some new territory, like unknown, I mean, whether on the ground, on the ice or in the cosmic. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really like a, a bright way as well for celebrating the light. Uh, so that is really nice. So thanks a lot. Thank indeed. you. Dear. Thanks and, to you. Thanks for the invitation, indeed. So we we'll see each other again in the next uh, Physics Matters. Uh, Christine, you will let us know. Exactly. And we will meet there. And in the meantime, I will make as well by sharing my screen. So the announcement. So while... So, doing click, click, click. Voilà. So the next uh, uh, physics matter. So will be end of June. So we'll come back to the idea of having the last Thursday of the month. So this uh, month was a holiday. So and we took the opportunity of this uh, special light day on Monday. So next one will be on the 30th of June. So we're uh, coming back to quantum computer and as well the possibility to build some. So with uh, so Professor uh, so Zuk Butt, uh, who will speak uh, directly from um, so Basel University, and he will uh, explain how to build a fast, uh, small and hot uh, silicon spin uh, cubite. So that will be a very exciting presentation, and uh, you can see how. Um, so you can participate so still for free, so there is no problem to connect through the Zoom. You can also uh, connect uh, to our uh, FIP network, so by the QR, so that you can see there. And you can find as well on the region that you are living, so there are as well a map that the APS has put uh, together, so that you can find a lot of information and activity that could be helpful as well for your community. So that's uh, some uh, very interesting so heaven that we are trying to build up together uh, with uh, so this team that we have on the FIP. And uh, this physics matter is only one of them. So thanks, Luisa, again, for giving the possibility for this physics matter. Thanks to you. Thanks to you. And thanks a lot, Ombreta, for this uh, wonderful presentation and for the next expedition. So hopefully it will be even more measurement, even if now if they are also on the ground. So that's uh, yes. some interesting <laughs> aspect, you. easier access. So thanks a lot. And uh, we will stop then now. So thank you very much. Uh, to thank all you. Of, on all the thank questions. you, Christine. All the best to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.